I'm Dick Gauthier, board chair of World Affairs Council of Western Michigan. I think we should start off by thanking the great staff, the servers, the cooks, et cetera, for our great lunch today. Amway Grand Plaza always puts on a very nice show for that. So we're going to get the show started today. Um, we are going to honor our two awardees, and then afterwards, I'll be having a conversation with the ambassador. We had the privilege of having dinner with the ambassador last night here in the hotel, and I think uh, you will, as I did, find him both extremely knowledgeable and charming in equal measure. So to get things started, I'd like to bring to the podium Renee Tabin, Market President, Bank of America. Thank you very much. And thank you to the World Affairs Council of West Michigan for providing us with this unique and very special opportunity to talk about things that are globally important. We are deeply grateful to be part of celebrating the diplomatic legacy of West Michigan's Senator Arthur Vandenberg and recognizing the global foresight of the council founders, Douglas Hillman and Edgar Orr. Honoring Ambassador Huntsman and Birgit Close for modeling international dialogue is important and a hallmark of our world-aware community. At Bank of America, I'm so very proud that my colleagues and I come to work each morning with the same purpose, and that is to make financial lives better through the power of connection. And we understand that in order to achieve that mission, to serve the businesses and the people and the institutions of West Michigan, we must be a globally astute company. In today's world, the power of connection cannot be local. It must be global. As a top global bank that has relationships comprising of 80% of the global Fortune 500, Bank of America is proud to co-sponsor this World Affairs Council program with our friends from Amway and the Meyer Foundation. We are eager to listen first, to thoughtfully engage in conversation and to ponder new ways to connect so that we all can succeed, both here in West Michigan and across the globe. So allow me to begin by introducing our first ever Hillman Orr Award recipient. Intended for a local resident who champions global awareness and collaboration. There is likely no one in this room who has not heard from Birgit Close on the importance of global economic ties between West Michigan and world partners. Under her leadership as the CEO of 32 years, The Right Place has created 47,000 new jobs and spurred nearly $5 billion in new investment in our local economy. Birgit is a leading economic development strategist. She collaborates with our local, our national, and our state government on critical issues related to economic development. She's a native of Germany and a leading authority in international business and economic development. She also leads the Right Place's international business development strategy by conducting several foreign direct investment missions to Europe, Asia, and the Middle East each year. I don't know when you do that. Uh, and she collaborates with the state of Michigan and the governor's office in doing that. She's a frequent speaker on national and international economic development issues. She's addressed audiences across the globe, including in France, England, Germany, Sweden, China, Australia, and Israel. So to my dear friend, I wanna say thank you. Thank you, Birgit, for guiding West Michigan on the global stage and establishing our region as an attractive international partner with countries from around the world. It is our privilege to present the inaugural Hillman Orr Award to Birgit Close. Oh, 
Good afternoon. Deep breaths and a Kleenex. Um, uh, thank you, Renee, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you for being a leader in the community and, and also a leader on the Right Place Board. I am incredibly deeply honored to be here today. Um, I want to also acknowledge um, my team members who are here today, which you just, I, I don't do this work alone. So please. And I also want to thank my husband who understands and has done global business himself, that when I have to go and do my job, um, he's incredibly supportive. So thank you, honey. When, when Michael from the World Affairs Council called me about this honor, um, I was truly stunned and speechless. Everybody in the room thinks, we wish we would experience this occasionally. <laughs> Um, but I have spent so much of my career in those 32 years at the right place with our regional companies, and as Dr. DeVos mentioned, in internationalizing our thinking. I wanted to be an ambassador for this community in other parts of the world to tell them about what it is we are all about and that, in fact, we will welcome um, foreign direct investment to our community. But I also wanted to spread the word in our region that embracing international, that embracing people from other parts of the world will enrich us. It does not make us poorer, it makes us richer. And that in fact, your competition today is no longer in Iowa or Indiana, but it is in Mexico, and it is in India, and it is in China. And the more we embrace that competition, we will be stronger as a region for it. And so the World Affairs Council has really modeled this thinking for the last 70 years. So to, to be part of this organization for all those, for many years that I've been um, the CEO of The Right Place, it's always been um, the strength of this community to really gather and think and embrace new ideas and new thoughts. So it's with great gratitude that I really accept this, uh, this award today. And it's really gratifying to be doing this with Ambassador Huntsman, um, someone I have admired as a governor. He was a phenomenal governor of Utah. And for you to spend your precious time for our country overseas, thank you so very much for your service. Um, and of course, <laughs> and of course there's Hank Meyer, who wrote the Definity book on a senator I had never heard of when I moved here. And when I first met Hank many years ago, he said to me, Birgit, there needs to be a Vandenberg Square in Germany. And I'm like, who is Vandenberg? It's another Dutch guy. <laughs> and, um, and he's like, no, let me tell you about Senator Vandenberg. And I was stunned. Growing up in Germany, in a divided Germany, um, we always lived in the shadow of the Soviet Union, right? We all learned about the Marshall Fund and how it helped Germany and Western Europe get back on its feet. We learned about NATO, but I had never heard of the senator who was really the person behind the scenes who made the Marshall Fund happen, who made NATO happen, who made the UN happen, and who brought along senators who were isolationists, who thought it's 1945, we won the war, let's all go home and be done with it and leave those Europeans to themselves. But he had learned that after World War I, that didn't work. And so he, who was an isolationist himself, became a globalist. And frankly, we could use a more globalist, a few globalists today, right? Um, I grew up in the safety of NATO. I grew up with a German Wirtschaftswunder predicated on the Marshall Plan, period. So for that, Every time I walk by that statue, I go a little, thank you, truly. So, um, and there, of course, are Judge Hillman and Ed Orr. And here's something you may not know. Ed Orr was one of the original 13 founders of The Right Place. So we owe Ed more than one thank you. But those two gentlemen were are and were emblematic of what this community is all about. And that is collaboration, 
thinking outside the box, and bringing people together around ideas. So 70 years ago, both Ed and Judge Hillman obviously had the great idea of starting um, this organization, and it's thriving. And I think that goes to who we are as a region. So let's continue all that great work and think, act locally, and think globally. So thank you very, very much. Birgit, that was a wonderful summary of my brief remarks. Uh, <laughs> good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Hank Meyer, and it's, it's a real privilege to join this group today for a landmark event that centers on the role in our lives of diplomacy and global cooperation. And those of you who know Arthur Vandenberg's history, and we just learned some more right now, are aware that the senator came to understand after World War II that international engagement and collective security were vital to our peace and freedom. As chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, he was second to none in forging bipartisan support for those three pillars of American leadership in the last seven decades, the United Nations, the Marshall Plan, and NATO. And yet, we're not just talking about ancient history. Uh, I'm, I get Google alerts on Arthur Vandenberg, and in the, in the, <laughs> In the midst, I know, it's a little weird, but in the midst of the, in the, midst of the Iran crisis, some commentators are, are quick to quote our senator on the need for unity when the United States acts overseas. Not a stifling of debate, of course, but a general agreement that politics stops at the water's edge. That's a famous quote often ascribed to him. At the same time, and often on the other side of the same issue, Debates flare up over the responsibility of the president and the role of Congress if America goes to war. And Vandenberg was dying of cancer in an upstairs bedroom over on Morris Avenue when President Truman declared a police action to respond to North Korean aggression on the Korean Peninsula. And that began what has become an age of undeclared wars. Fellow senators back then turned to the ailing statesman from Grand Rapids for guidance. Did President Truman act too hastily? Shouldn't he have consulted the Senate first? Vandenberg's wisdom, as true today as it was then, was there's no easy answer. Every situation is different. In time of emergency, the President, as Commander-in-Chief, may have to act before Congress has time to debate the matter. But the President is also ultimately responsible to Congress and must seek its support as soon and as fully as possible. I'm grateful to the World Affairs Council of Western Michigan for inaugurating the new tradition of the Vandenberg Prize in honor of one of our native sons. His statesmanship inspired those founders, Judge Hillman and Ed Orr of the council and reminds us all of the that global awareness and international dialogue, these aren't some abstract ideas that are reserved for Washington, but they're virtues that are important to all of us as citizens. And congratulations, Birgit, for being recognized as our West Michigan exemplar of that spirit. And it's now my honor to present the first Vandenberg Prize to someone who's, I think of it as a high wire, bipartisan exploits reflect the courage and the accomplishments of Arthur Vandenberg. John M. Huntsman, Jr. has been a United States ambassador for three presidents, George H.W. Bush, Barack Obama, and Donald Trump. In that role, he has served as our top diplomat in the other countries that loom largest on the world stage, Russia and China. He's the only American to serve as ambassador to both nations. And in these partisan times, his nomination for both posts, as well as for an earlier one as ambassador to Singapore, one unanimous approval in the Senate. How often do we hear that happening? He has served five presidents in all, has chaired the Atlantic Council think tank, whose CEO said of him, he's one of the few individuals who captures both the essence of bipartisanship and the political savvy to get things done. 
Better words could not have been designed to describe Arthur Vandenberg as well. So as West, as West Michiganders eager for global interactions that promote our interests, as well as enriching the economic, cultural, and social growth around the world, we look to leaders such as Ambassador Huntsman for models of the ethics and civility and relentless striving to work out differences that characterize the best in our country. We're delighted to present the first World Affairs Council of West Michigan Vandenberg Prize to Ambassador John Huntsman. Thank you. Thank you. Hank, thank you for those very thoughtful words. Uh, you were the kind of person that is a dream come true when it comes to who you might sit next to at a dinner reception. I sat next to Hank last night, and he was a font of unbelievable information and knowledge. And uh, I have enormous respect for him, as I do those who have brought this council together for purposes of education and enlightenment and bringing Western Michigan uh, along. Let me just say that as a diplomat, you're supposed to say nothing when there's something to say. And you're supposed to say something when there's nothing to say. You're always caught between a cliche and an indiscretion. I have found. So I hope in a moment when we're up here that there are no cliches and that there are no indiscretions. Just a sense of gratitude on my part for this unbelievable recognition in the name and in the spirit of Arthur Vandenberg, someone who I have looked up to for a good part of my professional career. Now I'm honored to be here with Mary Kay, my much better half who is here. Stand up, Mary Kay. mother of seven, including two active duty uh, naval officers. So if you can't learn diplomacy while raising seven kids, you'll never learn diplomacy. <laughs> it will all be war. Uh, but I wanna thank Dick and the team here at, uh, at, uh, at the council for reaching out to me in Moscow. Because trying to track down the US ambassador in Moscow is about the hardest damn thing in the world. You live a very compartmented life. <laughs> most don't know where you're hanging out. Your communications are, uh, in most cases, uh, uh, secure. Uh, so the very fact that this council was able to find me uh, in my hideaway in Moscow, trying to figure out how best to stay a step ahead of the FSB and the thugs in the Kremlin, uh, was something that I thought was pretty remarkable. But I also got reflecting a little bit on, on Michigan and what the state has meant to me uh, and to our family. Uh, I served for many years on the board of Fort Motor Company, uh, as I did Velasquez Communication in Livonia. So a lot of the uh, education I got was from companies right here uh, in Michigan, and, and I will be forever grateful. But let me just um, end with this thought. Uh, having followed in the heels of the world's greatest economic development person, Birgit, uh, and for the recognition that she got. I've known about her having been governor of a state that we used to claim as being the hottest economic state in America. And she was always the exemplar of how economic development is done right. So it's such a pleasure to be able to follow uh, in, in, in her stead. But Vandenberg did talk about politics ending at the water's edge. And I think we need to reflect on that sentiment because that's lost a lot in the gab fests and the political division that we face today. It's still a reality. The world wants to see the United States unified around our core principles. We might criticize ourselves internally and we're our, 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 our own worst critics when it comes right down to it. The world wants us united with the exception of Russia and China sometimes. They want to see our values on display. They envy what we have built. They might not always agree with what we've done and the way we exercise and execute power, but by and large, they respect the United States and they respect Americans. And when we're together and when we shine and when we recognize that politics ends at the water's edge, 
There's no weapon system that the Pentagon can produce that is more powerful than that sentiment and how it moves other people around the world. I have seen it. It's our nation's most powerful weapon. And I know that Vandenberg probably saw that. So kudos to all of you who are here today and keep this organization going. And just remember this, your slogan. In order to change the world, first you must know the world. It's a big deal. Vandenberg's from this neighborhood. I woke up this morning, opened the shades, and I looked at the Gerald Ford Museum. What came to mind? The Helsinki Accords, 1975. It hit me like this. Human rights. One person stood up as a leader in the United States and said it's time to pull together with our allies around the proposition of human rights. And it impacted the entire world, particularly the Soviet Union back then. You remember the story, one person from this neighborhood who stood up and said, I think I'm gonna bring about some change in the world. He knew the world, he studied it first, and then he went about changing it. So to the college kids who stood up just a moment ago, I saw you, you're not hiding. I want you to remember as you exit today, you can forget everything else that you hear, but you have the power to change the world. One person who can get out there, learn the issues, get educated, and do what Arthur Vandenberg did and do what Gerald Ford did. Take an interest, get motivated, and change the world for the better. Thank you so very much for this great honor. Ambassador, you mentioned uh, in your remarks just there not wanting to do any cliches today. Um, <clears throat> when I think of one of the biggest cliches in Washington today, it's intractable partisanship. Uh, it seems to be infecting everything. And um, it occurs to me that you are the antidote to that. You've demonstrated through your career that you are the very, the, the very measure of bipartisanship. It's only because no party will have me. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> We're very happy to have you here today because um, we love to receive guests at the World Affairs Council that have recently separated from U.S. diplomatic service. And there's two reasons for that. One is they have extensive, extensive, very fresh knowledge of world events. And the other is now they can say exactly what they think. <laughs> So we're looking forward to that uh, today. Um, <clears throat> besides congratulating you for your Vandenberg Prize, I want to congratulate you as well for having concluded your service in Moscow for a foreign government without having been poisoned, shot, or detained. <laughs> <laughs> so it brings me to my first question. Um, you had said last night during dinner that uh, you occupied some of the most dangerous geography in the world. That you sat in Moscow right in between Presidents Trump and Putin. <laughs> so we'd like to hear a little bit about how you handled that. Um, and, and after that, maybe uh, how you handled um, the accusations of the meddling um, in the elections, and maybe you may have a prediction for us for what may happen in November. Hmm. Dick, thank you. And I, get they, I guess they say in politics, if you can leave public office without being impeached or indicted, you're doing pretty well. And if you can get out of your diplomatic post in Moscow without being shot or poisoned, you're doing pretty well. You know, I found uh, both in the cases of Moscow and Beijing, because there's a lot of disinformation that swirls around about what's happening in those relationships, a lot of disinformation. The best thing that a senior American diplomat can do is to find channels of communication with the local government that are trustworthy, that uh, where you can build relationships of trust uh, and communicate uh, sensitive messages 
uh, and make sure that where there is a misunderstanding, you can put out those fires before you get to the brink of war. And all too often we find ourselves at the brink of war when you have two countries that are the top nuclear powers in the world. So I went about finding uh, a conduit uh, in the Kremlin. Uh, I knew it wouldn't be Putin, although I spent time with Putin, uh, who's a, an interesting figure, um, 68 years old, about five foot five. Um, he enters a room and you don't know he's there often. He sits at the negotiating table uh, and he isn't the table pounder. He doesn't yell and scream. He's so soft-spoken that sometimes you can't even hear him. He has a sense of humor, uh, a great sense of humor. Uh, and he's shrewd as can be. He's been in office for 20 years. He knows every trick in the book. Uh, he's dealt with every head of state over and over again, so you can't pull any fast ones on him. The only thing you can do is to be prepared uh, and to make sure that what you're asking for and trying to achieve is backed up by American power. Um, he was an average student at uh, Leningrad State University. He was bullied uh, in elementary school, came from a broken family. Uh, he was recruited by the KGB out of Leningrad State and served for 17 years um, as a case officer, uh, and uh, some of it in East Germany. Mm -hmm. And he rose to the rank of, of lieutenant colonel uh, in the intelligence services. And then he went into the um, mayor's office in St. Petersburg, Mayor Sobchak, who was a reform-minded mayor. And he did, of all things, economic development in St. Petersburg. When the empire was collapsing, when the Soviet Union was beginning to come to an end, and later was picked up by Boris Yeltsin to work in Moscow uh, as part of the security services. And he bounced between the National Security Council and the FSB, which is the successor to the KGB. And then, of course, as in true fashion, uh, you find this both in China and in Russia, whoever's leaving office has to find someone who will protect them, their family, and their holdings, <laughs> or else you're going to be in deep trouble. So Yeltsin, uh, upon his departure, uh, found basically a, a, a virtually unknown apparatchik uh, to take over the presidency. And he's been there ever since. So he's shrewd, and uh, I needed to make sure that we had a, a, ch a channel of communication. So I, I went to one of his top advisors, his national security advisor, uh, Yuri Ushakov, and we developed a very close relationship. The kind of thing where I could ring him up on the phone and, and within 15 minutes he would see me in the Kremlin. Hmm. We just had that kind of rapport. And so when there were a lot of sensitive issues and we needed to get right to the, the boss, <laughs> as, yeah. as he called, you know, that worked pretty well. And I had a similar kind of structure in China, although the Chinese system is larger and a lot more diffuse, and it was hard to find that special somebody because there are a lot more moving parts. On election meddling, I was very open about what had gone on in all of my meetings and all of my public statements because the first thing I did upon getting my security clearances for my job, and I'd had a lot of security clearances in my career for various other jobs, but when you go to Moscow, you get a lot more because they open different compartments that you need to be part of. And uh, I asked for the file on election meddling because I wanted to read the classified version of what a lot of people had seen by way of the unclassified version in the New York Times. And I think. So I read, I read the file, the first thing I did, and it was pretty clear to me what had happened and who was behind it and who was being targeted and so on and so forth. And anyone who would read that would probably conclude the same thing. And uh, I watched closely the malign activities coming out of the Russian government focused not just at the United States, but at our friends and allies in Europe, particularly those in South Europe, those sort of new vulnerable democracies um, for whom elections are relatively new. Uh, they're being preyed upon. Uh, they're being hit by propaganda, by misinformation, by fake news, by cut out uh, websites, uh, funding extremist political movements, uh, and assassination. They're all part of the toolbox. And it became clear to me that, you know, for a long time, and this isn't just a recent phenomenon, but going back to Gerald Ford's period, I remember reading about a conversation that Gerald Ford had with Brezhnev, where Brezhnev wanted to get involved in the election back in 1976, because he liked Gerald Ford. He wanted uh, to pursue arms control. 
He thought that was good for the Soviet Union. So the Russians are very good at election meddling. They're not new to this. They, they have some skill in terms of their cyber capabilities, their troops on the ground in various countries, and how they can uh, work their, their magic. So what is my takeaway? As somebody who's also been governor of a great state and who was running again for governor of that great state, we don't have any idea the extent to which the Russians are prepared and capable of interfering in our local elections. This is what I am concerned about most. And for those of you who are in touch with your state elections offices, you should ask what they are doing. Because the Russians, I don't know if you paid any attention to this, but they infiltrated uh, a couple of dozen state uh, voter registration files a couple of years ago. They didn't do anything, they pulled out. I don't think they knew that we were watching but we were, and all this was made public, so I can tell you, uh, it was leaked to the New York Times like everything else some time ago. And, uh, <laughs> but it, it did, uh, I think, serve as a wake-up call to those who care to understand what's going on. The ability of a foreign intruder to get into a local voter registration bank, to mix up voter registration times, places, outcomes of local elections. No, this isn't the presidency of the United States. This is county commission, mayor, city council. Imagine just flipping the outcome of a race upside down, mm -hmm. causing complete havoc, mm -hmm. uh, and therefore uh, calling into question the trustworthiness of that which we prize most, our local democratic processes. That would be catastrophic. Mm -hmm. And I think about the local elections in Utah, how easily they can be manipulated and we could be thrown into a tailspin of concern. Uh, and uh, th these are the kinds of things that I worry about most as it relates to election meddling. Don't, don't worry about the national elections. They'll always be meddled in by probably five different countries. I, I was gonna say Russians are not the only bad actors. They're not the only bad actors. They are probably, so in terms of cyber capabilities, the, the Russians use cyber for political purposes. Mm -hmm. Their goal here in the United States is to sow seeds of doubt and discontent and division. So you pop up a website during a mass shooting in a school and you talk, say a lot of extremist things on both sides. We think it's Americans. Mm, guess again. You have a racist incident somewhere in the United States. They will spin up a website and they will throw out extremist language pretending to be an American or an American organization. Guess again, it isn't. And we fall for it. Uh, and they're very good at it. They have troll farms in right outside of St. Petersburg that uh, do this kind of thing, run by one of Putin's, uh, Mr. Prigozhin, Mr., uh, Mr. Putin's former chef. Uh, and they'll, they'll continue doing this kind of thing, and they will confuse us. They will hoodwink us. Uh, they will sow seeds of doubt wherever they can. It's a tool that they can use, and there's nothing we can do in response. Mm -hmm. It's not shooting somebody. It's almost worse. Hmm. Swinging over to China, um, you briefly described uh, your relationship with President Putin. Um, can you give us an idea of uh, what extent your relation was, relationship was with President Xi? Sure. Um, I, I got to know Xi Jinping first when he was uh, vice president, which is generally the holding uh, position for the head of party. Mm -hmm. The leader of China typically has three positions, uh, two of which are really important. One doesn't mean a thing. The presidency of China, which means nothing. The general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, which means everything. everything. That's uh, an organization of 80 million members, and they meticulously weed out people from the ground floor up, and uh, if you want to go anywhere, be anything in China, you want to join the party. And uh, so he's, he's there, and then he's also chair of the CMC, the Central Military Commission, as he is now the newly stood up National Security Council, which they formed, I think, in the 18th Party Congress about eight years ago. Uh, so he is without uh, equal uh, in terms of his leadership. Maybe we haven't seen this since the days of uh, Deng Xiaoping, mm -hmm. maybe even Mao Zedong. So he leads the fifth generation. We've had Mao Zedong, the first. We've had Deng Xiaoping, number two. Jiang Zemin, generation three. Hu Jintao, generation four. And now we have generation five with, with Xi Jinping. He's a shrewd operator. 
He's not an intellectual like Premier Li Keqiang is, for example, who has a PhD in economics. But what I found in, in Xi Jinping is he's a political operator uh, without equal. And uh, he knows the levers of power in the country. He comes uh, from a princeling family. He's the son of uh, Xi Zhongzun, who was a vice premier under Chairman Mao, who was later thrown into prison uh, during the Cultural Revolution, as was his mother. And uh, she himself was sent out to, to the far west uh, for his labor term during the Cultural Revolution with his best friend, a guy named Wang Qishan, who is now the vice president of China. And he learned about China at its worst during that period. This is what's important to know about Xi. He saw China at its most chaotic, at its very worst during that period, 66 to 76, the Cultural Revolution. And I think he's vowed within his own mind never to repeat those days, never. So a lot of what he does is focused on economic growth, stability, the China dream, which you read on billboards in China. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you drive down the streets in China, you'll see Zhongguomeng, you know, China dream. And it's kind of the old sort of, you know, the American West thing, you know, think big, you know, you can be whatever you want, be aspirational, it's one of those deals. Uh, but he's around and he'll, he'll, you know, he'll be around until the 20th Party Congress, which is in 2022. Now the big question mark will be, will he be the first head of party to stay beyond two five-year terms? Nobody else has done that. Mm -hmm. Now they've changed the Constitution to uh, uncap the term limits for the presidency, which again is a position that means nothing. So he could continue going on as president and he wouldn't have the power of the party or of the military being head of the Central Military Commission. But in Chinese fashion, there is hierarchy in all things. And he is number one among equals. So as Deng Xiaoping was, Deng Xiaoping in his years of power had no title. He was head of the Chinese Bridge Association. He played cards. He was chairman of the Chinese Bridge Playing Association. But, but he was a top guy in the country. So as long as Xi Jinping is around, he will be a factor uh, to be dealt with. But what we all need to look at, so we're entering some really interesting years here as it relates to both China and Russia. So uh, Putin is constitutionally limited in 2024. He's out of a job. So what are they gonna do? There's no replacement for Putin. You can talk to the intelligence services, you can talk to the think tanks. Nobody knows, nobody knows who's next because he's done such an unbelievable job in consolidating his power. There's not even a party to speak of. I mean, the Russia United Party has no bench. They have no, no, real, no real substance. I tried to find in all of the 80 plus oblasts, the provinces around Russia, okay, who's the rising star like I used to do in China? In China, there's a very set way of trying to identify the next generation of leaders and you know generally where they come from and where to look. They come from you know, vice governors in provinces, they come from vice mayors in the major cities, they come from some of the ministries. In Russia, there's no nowhere to look. It's just Putin, he and some oligarchs, they just run the country. So 2024, keep your eye on that, who's next? Yeah. I think next is probably instability in Russia and I really worry about that when they have you know, roughly 5,000 nuclear weapons and the ability to deliver them with great precision from airplanes, submarines, and land-based systems. Mm -hmm. In the case of China, the 20th Party Congress in 2022, so we're ready for the sixth generation. Nobody knows who in the sixth generation is next. This is a, the first I've seen in my years of watching China, which has been most of my adult life. So I thought it was gonna be Sun Zhongcai, who was the party secretary in Chongqing. Then he was rounded up and disappeared. And then I thought it might be the, 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 the governor in, uh, in, in, uh, in Guangdong. He was disappeared under the anti-corruption and sent away. So the, the, there's no odds on favorite anymore. So it'll be really interesting to see if she decides to hang out beyond 2022 and we go right from the fifth generation to the seventh generation and totally skip the sixth generation. It's hard to know, but for those of you who are interested, it's a really important thing in terms of where China goes because leadership is everything there. Yeah, another important development in Asia was uh, last Saturday, President Tsai in Taiwan was reelected. Um, and and, and that's, a, that's a big deal for that region because um, her party is the DPP, 
which supports independence from China. Um, and um, given the protests in Hong Kong, um, some of the Taiwanese are a bit fearful about uh, outsized influence in Taiwan from the Chinese. As a matter of fact, a lot of Thai, uh, Taiwanese flew across an ocean to vote just to make sure that yeah. the uh, yeah. President Tsai was yeah. reelected. So over the next four years of the DPP, how does that affect uh, Xi Jinping's um, machinations uh, with uh, Taipei? Um, what do you think the President Tsai's posture will be with China? And what does the United States do about this? Because it continues um, to be uh, um, a, a tough situation there. The trend under Xi Jinping with the party has been to look inward. So his, when Xi wakes up every morning, his dashboard indicators he looks to are what's unemployment, what is inflation, what are the domestic conditions? Because the last time they, the country almost got out of control was June of 1989, Tiananmen. Well, Tiananmen was not necessarily a result of the death of Hui Albang, who was a beloved uh, general secretary of the party. Uh, the students gathered upon his death, but then they really were supercharged when the taxi drivers and the lorry drivers joined them because food prices and gas prices were off the charts high and uh, it almost toppled the country. It was a very serious set of conditions. So the leadership in, in China, they vowed at the time in the aftermath, if you read some of the Tiananmen papers and the conversations they had internally uh, in the aftermath of Tiananmen Square, never again will the domestic conditions get to the point where we could lose control of our country. So she worries about that first. He worries about the diaspora second. So the, the broad diaspora, where are Chinese elsewhere? And how does that relate to my recovering the lost territories? So I say, so if you look at the old Qing Dynasty maps, so the Qing Dynasty ended in 1911. And if you look at the maps of that period, that was a rise, remember, 1912 was a rise of the Republic of China under Sun Yat-sen. The maps then, which is what, the, what China still recognizes today, included Inner Mongolia, Xinjiang, Tibet, Hong Kong, Macau, South China Seas, Taiwan. So these technically, according to Beijing, are all theirs. Mm -hmm. And if you've noticed, one by one, they've tried to get them all back and recover them. Mm -hmm. So Xinjiang is part of China, Tibet is part of China, Inner Mongolia is part of China, Hong Kong, 97, went back, 99, Macau reverted. Taiwan is the outlier, mm -hmm. and the South China Sea, uh, the, the Paracel and Spratly Islands, of course, are gonna be in dispute forever, because you got five claimants. But with Taiwan, this is a real irritant for, for the Communist Party. Mm -hmm. And it's what they've done to themselves, as they've tightened uh, their control and snuffed out any competing voices and uh, ensured that the only thing that people read and hear on, on television is basically state propaganda. Uh, those who are living in relative freedom, like in Hong Kong and Taiwan, uh, are going in just the opposite direction. So I've lived in Taiwan twice, and back in the 1980s, I used to attend the outlawed political rallies of the Min Jin Dan, the DPP, the Democratic Progressive Party. They were all rallies, not in Mandarin, but in Taiwanese, you know, to show their, their, their individuality from the mainland. Sure. And I watched when, uh, I, we were, Mary Kay and I were living there, when Chiang Kai-shek's son, Zhang Jinghua, the last dictator of Taiwan, died. His funeral was in a hospital, just you know, in a military complex, just behind where we were living. And then you had the rise of the first native-born Taiwanese uh, who became president, and there was a huge fight over the direction of Taiwan. Well, now they're a full-blown democracy, and you've got an unbelievable leader in Tsai Tai Ing-wen, who I know is and is a friend, and I've been over to see her in her presidential palace, the, the old Japanese headquarters mm -hmm. in downtown Taipei. And uh, she is moving the whole political system toward a sense of identity around being Taiwanese, not Chinese. So when you sit in a meeting with her, unlike her predecessors, where they would say they would refer themselves, woman Zhongguoren, we Chinese, she will say, woman Taiwanren, we Taiwanese. And it's, the way they see the world and themselves is completely different. Mm -hmm. And it's been a sea change in my years of being involved there. And there's no going back. Yeah. So of the 20, 22 million people in Taiwan, 
probably 80% of whom are locally born or from lo local families versus the Weishengren who, are, who come from uh, mainland families who followed Chiang Kai-shek over in 1949. This is gonna be a huge problem. And you, you, you better believe they're watching Hong Kong mm -hmm. very, very closely. And when you get one-fifth of the population in Hong Kong, ladies and gentlemen, one-fifth of the six million people who live there who turn to the streets, it's a big deal. And uh, Beijing is not gonna be able to turn that off. So they're a little bit stuck because they can't crack down. There can't be violence because uh, investment and business will flee. Uh, they will lose face in the international community. Uh, so they're, they're at a standoff right now. And the Hong, Kong, Hong Kongers are, are not gonna conform. There was a deal that was struck in 1997 between Margaret Thatcher and Deng Xiaoping in terms of how the following 50 years would be handled. The status quo, rule of law, civil society will prevail, notwithstanding some changes in the Legislative Council and how they choose their chief executive. That changed a little bit, and it's more, a little more democratic even than it was under British rule. But it's a big problem, and it's not going away. Mm -hmm. So how volatile will it be? Uh, it's hard to know, but I think a lot of the volatility will be in response to the force shown by Beijing, mm -hmm. and they have to be hyper careful about what that then leads to. Yeah, whether that's um, hard power or soft power. And when you talk about uh, soft power, I think uh, diplomats like to talk about soft power all the time because they're an integral component of that. Um, last year we had uh, Ambassador Barbara Stevenson here, who is now president of the um, Foreign uh, uh, Policy Association. And um, her concern was that China was rapidly increasing their number of diplomatic posts around the world, and they were starting to catch up with the United States, which has been historically the number one. Um, and um, just last month it happened. Um, China now has more foreign postings of their diplomats than the United States. I think the number is 276. So for you, is that significant, um, or is it worrisome? No. Okay. It's something that uh, you could see coming. And here's the world in which we're going to have to live, folks. <laughs> uh, China reaches parity with the United States in virtually every category. Uh, uh, economics, military. So my, my son, who's now living on an aircraft carrier, he flies a strike jet off, off the USS Abraham Lincoln. He tells me about the, car the second carrier being developed in China. I watched the first one, uh, the, the, the Shenyang, uh, built in Dalian. And uh, pretty soon they'll have carrier battle groups that probably rival the number that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, their maritime capability is uh, soon to catch ours in terms of quality. Their submarine fleet is excellent. Their uh, air power is uh, increasingly good. Their uh, weapon systems, uh, namely their nuclear and propulsion systems, their ballistic capability is much improved. Um, so I'm trying to find a category in which if we all live long enough, they're not gonna be with us at the 50 yard line. Mm -hmm. And we just have to deal with that. You know, that doesn't mean World War III. That should mean World War III. It just means we have to get used to a real rival. We've never seen a real rival. Uh, so, but here's what I want you to look at when it comes to soft power and the number of consulates and embassies and, and, and diplomats. And it does irk me a little bit, and I tell this to my sons, that there are more musicians in Defense Department marching bands than there are diplomats of the United States right now. And I think that's probably a number that we can improve upon yeah. just a little bit yeah. in the diplomat category. But you choose a country, choose a capital, and go out early one morning and just look who's in line for a visa hmm. at our places versus Chinese embassies yeah. or any other country in the world. And that should answer right there what, uh, what uh, soft power uh, does for us. People want to come here. That hasn't stopped as long as I've been involved with managing embassies, which has been a long time. Uh, people want to come here. I think that's the Bill Bennett Gates test, right? You, you put up a, a gate at the, at the border of every country and see which way people that's, are going. That, that's right, yeah. that's right. And, well, we would like to open it up to the audience if, uh, if uh, anybody has some questions for the ambassador. Um, um, Erica and Michael both have, uh, or there's a microphone in the middle of the room if you'd like to walk up and uh, ask your question. 
We'd love to hear it. Uh, what's it going to take to get Russia out of the Crimean Peninsula? Probably a war that we're not willing to fight. I, I don't know that we're going to see this happen anytime soon. And part of it is a function of the relative strength of the Russians versus uh, the Ukrainians. And uh, there may be a negotiated settlement at some point between uh, Ukraine and Russia. I hope there is, because there's been a blatant violation of international sovereignty and international law, and we should all care about that. But as you used to watch it from Moscow, I, I'm just a hard-headed realist. So what is going to get the Russians out? What's going to get the Russians out of northern Georgia, out of South Ossetia and Abkhazia? What's going to get the Russians out of Nagorno-Karabakh, where they kind of fan the flames on both sides? What's going to get them out of Transnistria, uh, uh, close to Moldova? Well, so far, nothing. We now have about 1,000 sanctions against Russian organizations and people. I wrote a piece in, in the, for the Wall Street Journal the day that I left Moscow. The, the minute that I was a civilian and didn't have to vet everything with the State Department public affairs section, I wrote something and just sent it in to the Wall Street Journal and said, certainly there is a more effective way of dealing with Russia other than layering and layering and layering and layering more sanctions on. Why? Because they don't care. And they find outlets through black markets and allied individuals uh, to get their business done anyway. And most of their income is a combination of gas and oil. And they've already got all these customers in Europe who were addicted to the heroin and weapon systems like the S-400 systems that they sell routinely around the world. That's their balance sheet, basically. So we do sanctions and you know, members of Congress stand up and high five each other like, we're taking them on, we're getting it done. Doesn't work that way. We got to figure out a new mousetrap because that just doesn't do it. So as it relates to uh, the Black Sea region and to Crimea, where historically it is a very, very sensitive piece of geography. If you go back and you know read geog read about the region, read about history, and there has been a blatant violation of, of international law, and uh, we should stand tall for the recovery of that land, it given back to the Ukrainian government. Uh, but it's words until we can figure out a way to actually force the behavior of the Russians. And right now, they're just not incentivized to do it, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. One more question? One more, please. So having, uh, having lived in Russia myself for a few years and having in, been investigated by the FSB myself, my question for you is, sir, as, as a government official, it's something that we, we get used to. My question is, how was your family able to cope with your position and your post? <laughs> well, let me just say that China was pretty good training, because <laughs> the Chinese are pretty good at it, too. Uh, first of all, you don't take it personally when you're surveilled. And when you're sitting with your wife at dinner, you've got your own security people who are with you large burly people who you'd never want to take on, and somebody comes and sits right next to you and pulls out their phone and aims it right toward you just to harass. You know, you don't take that personally. You don't take personally that, you know, your, your Chinese adopted daughter is pulled out of a traffic crosswalk and, 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 and sent to a police car to sit for a while. Um, you, you, you don't you take personally the idea that wherever you go, you're listened to, your phones are, uh, your personal conversations, you know going into it what it's going to be. And uh, let me just say without providing too much detail, we're pretty good at it too on this end, sometime to the point where you'd like to say enough is enough. Let's just stop harassing both sides and try to build a little bit of confidence in between. But it's just the way that, uh, that nations conduct business, particularly those who are very, very concerned about, um, should we say, regime change. So things picked up on the surveillance side 
probably after the 2012 election. They, they've all, for all of my predecessors, go, going all the way back to Bill Bullitt in 1933, there's always been serious surveillance, but it really picked up in, in after Putin was reelected in 2012. He really seriously thought that there was conspiracy underway, directed and led by the U.S. Embassy in Moscow uh, to fund opposition movements and to organize to overthrow him. And a lot of what happened in 2016, without getting into too much detail, is a, was a response to the 2012 election. We don't talk about that enough, but there were some motivating factors that occurred in 2012 that, let's just say, encouraged the bad behavior of the FSB and Putin to get back at us. Uh, but ever since then, things were really tight. And, you know, it was okay for me. I expect the U.S. ambassador to be harassed and surveilled and for you had to have zero freedom and even conversations unless they're from a special place at a special time. Um, but what was hard was when there were junior officers uh, in the Foreign Service and beyond who would be picked on and in some cases who would be PNG'd, kicked out of the country. So we saw the largest ever expulsion rate when I was ambassador. I don't think because of my management, but because the Russians started taking after us for taking after them for the 2016 election meddling and for the Skripal poisoning in the UK, whereby we booted out over 100 intelligence operatives of theirs from the United States. This has all been public, so I'm not telling you anything that isn't. And they took after us with reckless abandon. They, so if you can imagine a business, so I had probably 1,500 people in the embassy in Moscow, one of the largest in the world, Beijing's larger, um, and they cut our workforce by 70% just across the board. And then we were cut again the following six months by 60. These are the best trained Russia experts in diplomacy, intelligence, military. In some cases, spouses who served together, one of them was sent out, the other couldn't leave, had to stay. The worst form of harassment. In some cases, you know, folks who had given 30, 35 years of their life to one subject, no longer able to work or even enter Russia, ever. Uh, and then there were junior officers who uh, had their uh, promising careers come to an end uh, as a result of that. That was, hard. that was hard for me to see as their leader. Uh, and I still, you know, reflect on those moments as being very, very difficult for me, the most professionally I think I've ever dealt with. But they're resilient. The Foreign Service folks, our diplomats are among the best I've ever worked with. Uh, they're amazing folks. And uh, we talk a lot about our men and women in uniform, and I have two sons in uniform, but sometimes I'd like to clump into that those who are less observable who do the work of the country in the shadows of foreign countries, some as diplomats and some as operators doing other things, they are unbelievable. And if every taxpayer could see what I have seen, they would be delighted to pay out their, their annual tax check because they get the work done for the United States. It's unbelievable. It's a great honor to serve with them. Okay, we're just about out of time, but we have one more question, please. Thank you, Ambassador, for your remarks. Uh, my question is about open trade. The United States has advocated for open trade for decades. Open trade has benefited bringing a lot of jobs, not just to the U.S., but to the world, and especially to Michigan. So what's your outcome regarding the controversy between the, the uh, trade disputes between uh, the U.S. and China? And uh, do you think this will be uh, going for a long haul? Thank I think you. We're, I think we're going through some growing pains with China. So are, are we an open economy? Yeah, our average weight of tariff in this country is less than 2%, so we're open. There are, in most every sector of the economy is open to, to foreign investment. Uh, not so with China. Uh, so we've reached a point where China now is on the world stage economically. Uh, they've gone through the easy years of economic growth, which is when you're an underdeveloped country. Now they've got a huge middle class, and so their growth prospects from here on are gonna be really tough. And that means the years of six, seven, eight percent growth are gone. You're looking at two, three, four percent best going forward with China. But they're having a hard time doing the market reform that we would have hoped that they would have done 20 years ago. Let me give you a quick example of that. So the president just kind of declared victory on 
phase one of our trade dispute with China, resolving it. And that's basically taking you know, $170 billion in trade. We had a 15% tariff on, on that category, took it off. He halved uh, the tariffs on about $120 billion in trade. There's about $250 billion in another category that will stay the same. So all of that in exchange for the Chinese purchasing $200 billion in U.S. goods over the next two years, which is totally laudable. But I have to tell you, when I was trade ambassador under George W., and we got China into the WTO, uh, our, our fallback position was always just to get the Chinese to buy more. <laughs> and back then, the going rate was about $10 billion. Now it's about $200 billion, And then you can call it a day. Call a truce. And that's kind of where we are. We can high-five each other, and you know we've taken tariffs down, so it'll be less onerous for some of the great companies in this room. But the phase two part is what I worry about. Because we're asking the Chinese to do something that they're not prepared to do. And they're not prepared to do it because they can't. Uh, and the Chinese will never do anything for which they'll lose face in the international community or in front of their own people. These are issues concerning um, indigenous innovation. So they, what do the Chinese want? They want to pick winners. They want a Boeing, a GE, a Bank of America. They want a Disney. A, a Disney. They want all the great name brands in the world homegrown. They're tired of buying from us. They're tired of recognizing U.S. supremacy in all of, uh, all of these categories. And that means that they have to force some of our companies that do business there to transfer their technology to the Chinese end of the JV so that they can then develop it. Weaning them from that is going to be really hard. Weaning them from stealing our intellectual property, which is a $300 billion per year problem. Uh, is asking for the impossible. They can do little things here and there, and they've got regional intellectual property courts set up to monitor and deal with it, but, but they probably can't do anything on, on, on that one. Um, there are a couple of other categories that we're asking for that are, that are quite difficult. So this is all part of the phase two. The hardest thing for them right now is how do you reform 100,000 dog, doggy, state-owned enterprises. Now, some of these state-owned enterprises are the biggest companies in the world, uh, like, uh, like, uh, like Sinopec, uh, Sihanouk, which are $500 billion market cap companies. But aside from those, you've got 100,000 really doggy, poor-performing regional state-owned enterprises, and they don't know what to do with them. They all have non-performing loans. They don't meet the metrics of any kind of international standard. And by reforming them, you're putting huge numbers of people out of work. And we talked earlier about what unemployment does to stability in uh, China. It, it, it ruins it. So we're asking for a lot of things that they just can't do right now. So ultimately, I think we're going to be like this. It'll be a standoff. Um, everyone loses in a trade war. I think we have to recognize that and make sure that we minimize the damage. Right now, the good economy is masking what could be greater damage to this country. So instead of growing at 2%, maybe we'd be growing at 25 or 3% if the tariffs were not applied or if we weren't carrying on this ongoing trade war. But when the economy begins to turn down, how much of this can we afford to do? We have an election coming up later this year. How will it play for 2020? Is being tough on China uh, a vote-getting mechanism uh, as against what it could do to the economy toward the end of the year? That's going to be a balancing act that the president is going to have to figure out. He's pretty good at that. And I suspect that his tough approach to China and opening markets will probably carry the day. So harsh rhetoric, that will continue. I have no doubt about that and probably calling some sort of timeout in imposing any more tariffs. I don't expect that we're going to see any more of those just because of the way they affect the marketplace. So hang on for the ride and get used to a world in which we have a real competitor. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being with us today. Thank you, Ambassador Huntsman, for your leadership and for your inspiration. Birgit, thank you again for doing the same locally. 
Um, if you're not one of our uh, 50 corporate members for 11 colleges and universities that are members, please, uh, please join us in this effort of global engagement at worldmichigan.org. We hope to see some of you at our Great Decisions series, which begins on February 10. There are brochures on your table and bookmarks to take with you. And uh, best wishes in all your endeavors. Thank you for being with us tonight.